So, uh, like John, I'm, I'm going to be using this screen here, and apologies for that, uh, for those that are sitting on the other side. So, um, we're, we're switching up gears a little. I'm going to focus on uh, AAV, but the use of AAV as a tool for doing something different uh, in the airway, and that is developing a uh, vaccine. These are my disclosures. So again, uh, something that you're going to see quite a bit in the meeting is using um, AAVs um, and what makes AAV so special are all these colourful little uh, protrusions um, on the capsid, the surface of the AAV, and that's something that we took advantage when we were trying to develop a, a gene therapeutic or a gene prophylaxis for um, infectious diseases. And again, the landscape of AAVs has changed quite significantly and has changed even more significantly, as we're going to hear throughout the meeting, uh, in terms of when it was first discovered in the 60s to the massive explosion of the different uh, serotypes pre-2002, post-2002, and what the field looks like currently now, where the vector cool kit, the toolkit has in, uh, been enriched with a whole bunch of new AAVs that specifically target not only tissues, but specific cell types within those tissues. So um, in terms of the different targeting of tissues by different AAVs, again, um, what we know for lung is that six and some variants of AAV6 actually target conducting airway really well, as well as alveolar epithelium. AAV1, not only um, neuron, but lung as well, as well as some of the others that you um, already are aware of, AAV7, 8, and 9. And for this talk, I'm actually going to focus on AAV9 and a particular uh, property of AAV9 that we discovered in the lab. So then um, changing gears a little in terms of trying something different, which is using gene transfer to engineer cells. So in uh, the context of an infectious disease and antibody production. So typically what happens um, the antibody production occurs in the bone marrow through to actually having antibodies secreted from plasma cells. So what we wanted to do is actually code um, the antibody gene, both the light and the heavy chains, into an AAV vector and have it uh, secreted. And that was actually shown by others in the field, um, Phil Johnson, that actually used AAV1 um, to actually secrete antibodies against SIV, which is the monkey version of HIV uh, in macaques, as well as from hepatocytes, so liver-directed uh, AAV vectors to actually have antibody production. So, and these are the papers describing this work here. So in terms of what are the pros and cons in terms of using passive transfer versus AAV <coughs> delivery? So um, passive transfer requires this repeated parental um, uh, administration, and it is very, very expensive and time-consuming to produce the antibodies. In terms of AAV delivery, duration of expression is key, and depending on the target tissue, you can actually have sustained and high gene expression. And what I'm going to show today is that you have the potential, depending on the type of vector that you use and the type of tissue that you target, to localize expression through the route of administration. And there's a continuously ongoing threat of an influenza outbreak, and even this year alone we've had significant uh, mortality and morbidity because of the flu vaccine not being effective for this particular strain. No means a, a, a pandemic, but again, showing that not every year we um, get the vaccine right. So the novel approach that we undertook to prevent infectious disease. So typically what happens in an infection in a population like this where um, we have healthy individuals, um, when they are exposed to virus, they mount an immune response. And depending on how good that immune response is and how virulent that immune strain of virus is, you will either have a resolution of that particular um, infection, which will give rise to broadly neutralizing antibodies, which will prevent subsequent infection from the same strain, or it won't be resolved, which typically happens in the case of a pandemic, and you have a lot of uh, disease and uh, mortality. So in an active immunization, for those that do take the flu vaccine, what will typically happen, again, you have a healthy individual, they're exposed to the vaccine, 
again, depending on the immune status of that particular individual, they will mount an immune response. And again, depending on how well that immune response to the virus is and how virulent that strain is, the patient will either be, or the subject will either be fully protected or not, but very rarely in that particular instance. And again, unless we're dealing with a pandemic, um, the patient will actually succumb to the infection, but rather will have disease. So what we are proposing to do is actually use AAV, uh, like uh, others, David Baltimore's group and uh, Phil Johnson's group, where we will use AAV to express the antibody, which upon encounter with the virus, it will actually um, fully protect the subject from an, uh, the virus. The difference to the previous strategies, which was either injecting intramuscularly or intravenously, is that what we're um, doing is harnessing our experience in the CF world and trying to uh, localise expression of the antibodies in the airway, especially for those that are airway pathogens, and focusing on flu as the first one. So typically what happens with an inhaled pathogen, you breathe it in from someone's cough or sneeze, and um, amplification typically occurs in the nasal airways, and by aspiration, it disseminates into the lower airways, where it typically causes disease or, in the case of a pandemic, death. So what we wanted to focus is this initial exposure. Try to create what would be known as a biomask. So have uh, antibody production in the nasal airways. So um, what would happen is we would target with our AAV vector expressing a broadly neutralizing antibody, target one of the particular cell types. And in this particular picture, I've uh, depicted the ciliated epithelium, but then again, there's more than one cell type. So typically what would happen is you would have the AAV vector expressing the antibody, transduces the AOA epithelial cell, and secretion of the antibody will occur on the apical surface. And again, for those that are not aware, apical surface is what is exposed to air. And the airway surface liquid layer is what allows the cilia to bathe in. So you would have a very typically small amount of antibody, but because you have a very small amount of airway surface liquid volume, that becomes really, really concentrated. And the cell keeps pumping out antibody for the duration of the lifetime of that cell, which for this is typically about three to six months. So then what would happen is what we would expect to happen, that you would have very highly concentrated amount of antibody in the nasal airway, so that upon exposure of that sneeze or the cough by your friend or colleague, the virus will be neutralized before it has the capacity to replicate and disseminate in the lower airways. So at the time, a very interesting antibody had come about, and that was um, FI6. And what was interesting about FI6, it um, was able to neutralize, bind and neutralize group one and group two um, influenza A viruses, which was quite important because it allowed us to look at both H1 and one strange, H5 and one strange, which actually had um, caused uh, pandemics in the past, as well as some of the others, such as, for example, the H3 and two strains, which are your typical seasonal flu. So then what we used was a combination of the AAV9 capsid and the FI6. And we used AAV9 because we had shown in the lab that it was efficient in transducing the airway, specifically alveolar epithelium, but also in the nasal cavity of the ciliated epithelium. What was interesting about AAV9 is that there's a very low seroprevalence of AAV9 in human subjects. And uh, we actually showed that it could be effectively re-administered in the airway. Whether this is uh, a characteristic of AAV9 alone, we're not quite sure. It could um, be apparent to other airway tropic uh, viruses, but for this, it was a very sustained result. And as everyone in this room, or the majority of this room knows, um, there's a growing clinical experience with AAV9. In terms of FI6, uh, broad activity against group one and group two influenza A. And what was interesting about this, because with this particular antibody, it's rather large, which means that we had to um, use specific portions of the antibody to be expressed by the limited packing capacity of the AAV. So um, what we demonstrated, A, we, using AAV9 expressing firefly luciferase, that we could actually localize expression in the nasal cavity. And what we showed here, and again, the, the graphs are almost self-explanatory,
We're using eight different strains, uh, clinical isolates. These experiments were done under level four uh, in collaboration with Gary Copinger in the Canada, where we're looking at different strains that have caused pandemics in the past. Um, H5 uh, Indonesia, the Vietnam strain, H5N1, the H1N1 2009, and more importantly, um, a reconstructed version of 1918 H1N1. And the lines that uh, go trend downwards are those animals that were naive, i.e. they didn't have a, uh, they were immune competent, but they were exposed to the virus and actually succumbed after a 40% weight loss in which they were euth uh, humanely euthanized. Those that are the flat lines are those animals that actually uh, did, for some, lose some weight, but overall all um, survived. We then changed models and went to something that was more uh, relevant to the influenza world, and that was a ferret, where we actually showed again with AUV9 uh, using firefly lysiferase that we could target the nasal epithelia and that the majority of the nasal septum, again, if you imagine the ferret looking at you from the screen, tip cut off, and you're looking down the septum, this light blue, I'm hoping you can see, um, is the transduced better gal cells. And again, similarly to what we had seen with the mice, we had a flat line across when mice were given, sorry, when ferrets were given either the H5N1 or the H1N1 strains and the naive animals succumbed to the infection. We then had the ability um, when the outbreak of H7 and 9 occurred in China to see how quickly we could deploy this particular um, strategy to actually show protection. So soon after the report of H7 and 9, we were able, um, through our collaborator, Gaya Grombinger, to get access to the virus and actually do these experiments in level four, where we actually did show, again, FI6, continuously used FI6, and there was a prediction that we should see some neutralization. But what we found is that we did have, uh, in red, those animals that were the naive that succumbed to the infection, and that's not surprising. But what we found was that we had significant weight loss but that the majority, about 70% of the animals, survived. So this um, brought up a different question, which was we didn't want to provide a scenario in which we had sterilizing immunity, but rather a scenario that we provide enough time to the host to mount its own immune response and protect. So then you would not have this emergence of escape mutants that you typically get in the setting of sterilizing immunity. So this is what we achieved here. So while the animals did lose significant amount of weight, we had a 70% survival because we allowed those animals a window in time to build their immune response. So then we focused on um, the influenza complications in the elderly. So this particular strategy wasn't meant to uh, compete with the typical yearly vaccinations for flu, but rather for those uh, populations in which the flu vaccine is not very effective, and one of them um, is the elderly. So typically you have almost 50,000 deaths per year because of the vaccine not being effective. And the economic burden is huge and in the order of almost a billion dollars. The majority of the subjects are over the age of 65 and typically have other comorbidities that actually contribute to the uh, reduced response to the flu vaccine. Again, these experiments were done in mice and what we actually looked at was two different mouse strains. One was the skid mice in which there wasn't an actual B T cell immune system so that we can actually see in the setting of an absence of a healthy immune system, how does this vaccine actually help those animals? And in this particular instance, we're looking at uh, Balbsi, so all the experiments were done in Balbsi mice, and, and the same background, the skid mice. And really there was no difference in terms of how well those mice actually responded, whether or not they had an immune system against flu, shown here, and the lines trending downwards are either the skids or the Balbsi's that were uh, not protected and given flu. In terms of how well um, in, uh, an immune competent animal does um, with age, so most of the experiments that I showed earlier were done in young animals, which we saw a flat line trending outwards for the entire of the experiment. But what we also found when we looked at middle-aged mice, and these are anything between six and nine months, or older mice, which are 18 months plus, that we really didn't see any differences, and again, the LD50 was adjusted according to um, the age group. 
But what we saw, again, a very similar profile in kinetics of weight loss and uh, succumbing to the infection for all three aged groups of these immune-competent mice. But those immune-competent mice with age didn't really have uh, any uh, issues with the flu uh, challenge. And going back to something that I mentioned earlier, which was that we didn't really want to confer sterilizing uh, immunity, this we were able to test in the setting of RAG knockout mice, those mice that don't have uh, B and T cells. So in this particular instance, we did a dose titration. And so we went from uh, the lowest dose, which was 10 to the 9 genome copies, and this is an actual dose, not per kilogram, up to um, so half log and a log higher. And what we found was, so typically, we give the victor, and then seven days later, we do the, uh, trend, uh, the challenge, and we monitor throughout the end of the experiment. What we found was, similarly to the previous experiments, that the um, uh, naive mice actually succumb to the infection in the red line here very quickly, so within seven to nine days. And those mice that were given the lower dose, the 10 to the 9, trended downwards as shown here and again a large uh, variation in terms of how those animals handled the um, flu but then all of a sudden we saw that there was a, a rebound in their weight but eventually those animals succumbed to the infection suggesting that the um, AUV vector encoded antibody was providing some protection but the viral replication of flu was much higher, so then the mites did not have enough time to actually catch up. In terms of the next highest dose, the half log higher dose, the three times 10 to the nine, they <laughs> modeled and were very similar to those animals that were given the 10 to the 10 dose. So flat line for almost four weeks, but then what we noticed with those animals that were given the three times 10 to the nine dose, that mid dose, all of a sudden the animals started losing weight. Again, suggesting that in this particular instance, we didn't have sterilizing immunity, so the antibody that was being produced didn't have the capacity to sterilize and actually neutralize the virus, but that the virus was kept on amplifying and eventually caught up, so those animals actually succumbed almost seven weeks after the infection. And those animals that were given the 10 to the 10 dose, which was the sterilizing dose, actually flatlined, didn't show any signs of infection. In terms of how lasting this will be um, for protection, we're looking at it from a point of view of a seasonal uh, flu vaccine. And so we looked at a low dose of 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 11, the high dose. Again, the 10 to the 11 dose is what we would consider a sterilizing um, dose. And uh, if we focus on the sterilizing dose, which is this over time, so up to six months, flat line across the board for those animals that appear in green. Those are the animals that have been vaccinated, suggesting that we um, maintain the level of expression that's required to sterilize the virus. What's more apparent is the low dose, so this is a hundredfold lower, and while at day 14 at peak uh, you do see this flat line, you start seeing a drop at one month, suggesting that because of that turnover of the respiratory epithelium in the nasal airway, you do start seeing some drop in the capacity of the vector approach to protect against flu. So even though those animals um, actually uh, recover from the infection, you do see up to six months that there is a significant strain that's put on those animals. So then we partnered with Janssen and used one of their antibodies that they developed. And the beauty of this approach was that the antibody is what is known as a universal antibody. So it protects against influenza A, group one and two viruses, most of which, uh, some of which actually have caused pandemics or epidemics, as well as seasonal flu, influenza B, which is again very, very important. But um, in this particular instance, we were able to just use the one vector expressing an antibody rather than multiple vectors and rely on a pool of viruses that would be given to a subject. So I'm sharing with you data that was just recently published in uh, Science. And what we did there is actually looked at the efficacy of AV9 expressing this particular multi-domain antibody that was developed by Janssen to actually show protection from that one AV vector against um, H1N1. This is the PRH strait, the mouse adapted PRH strait, um, the Hong Kong strain H3N2 as well as influenza B. And what is apparent, um, again, is that protection is dose dependent. 
but for most we can actually see flat lines across the board for protection against different strains of flu. The approach that we've developed, even though we used flu as our candidate virus, is not just limited to flu, but anything else that can be airborne or can be developed as an airborne uh, virus. And so um, in terms of other strains, we actually looked at Ebola, but you can imagine this can be applicable to RSV for which there's no real effective uh, vaccine. So I'll just share with you some data again that we've recently published, and that was using AEV9 to express ZMAP. And in this particular instance, we also focused on, so for those of you that know, ZMAP is comprised of three different antibodies, but we also looked at um, having expression of just the two antibodies. So we did that because the three different antibodies, 13C6, 2G4, and 4G7, 2G4 and 4G7 actually bind in a very specific area. So we decided to actually try, because in this particular instance, the antibodies were too large to actually fit into the same AUV vector, rather than having a pool of three different AUV vectors, to actually try having 13C6 co-expressed with 2G4 or 4G7. And at the time, the majority of the effort was put in having systemic expression of these antibodies to prevent from this blood-borne pathogen. But at the time, um, there was, uh, when the West Africa outbreak was occurring, with our collaborator, Carrie Kerbinger, we actually decided to actually look at the likelihood of Ebola being aerosolized, as was then subsequently shown that it can be. So we thought that this approach could be one that we could utilize in that particular setting. So for these types of experiments that were conducted under level four, we decided not to do uh, minimum effective doses, but rather go for the best shot, which was a large dose, a 10 to the 11 dose of AV9, and administer that uh, intranasally in uh, BABC immune competent mice, and then do the challenge. Um, the challenge occurred anything from uh, seven to 14 days prior, and as control at the time, we used the very precious ZMAP, and I say very precious because we weren't able to have too much of it because it was uh, allocated to patients. Um, but what we showed here, if you focus on the uh, purple line, this is a 10 to the 11 combination of um, the two different vectors uh, expressing 2G4 and 13C6, where we do see a dip in weight, but the animals recover, although we did have uh, some loss of animals. In terms of ZMAP, which is the positive control, um, it, wasn't, it was insufficient, the dosing that we provided was insufficient to actually uh, provide uh, protection against those animals. But when we actually um, used the 2G4 together with 13C6, we actually had uh, full protection. This is a, an antibody then that we subsequently optimized for expression and showing here in the orange line was that that human optimization actually uh, made the, that particular antibody work better. So in closing, um, we have developed an AAV-based prophylaxis vaccine for airborne infectious viruses. The beauty of the approach is that it's a single installation that's not invasive. You can imagine almost like a sprayer that someone can sniff in. It's not invasive. can be self-administered. Again, very, very important in those hot zones where um, you uh, need to have disbursement of the vaccine very quickly. We've shown that in certain models and with certain doses and uh, infectious viruses, we have efficacy in less than a day. And it can be produced very shortly after the discovery of the uh, monoclonal antibody or the protective antibody, which is one of the limitations of current pharma in which, for example, for the flu vaccine, it's a hypothetical uh, emergence of a virus strain for the subsequent year. And so with that, I'd like to um, thank uh, the main contributors of this work, Jim Wilson, my mentor, a whole um, team at uh, the Gene Therapy Program, Penn Vector, the Program for Comparative Medicine, as well as our funders, initially DARPA, and um, since then, Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Thank you for your attention. We can open it up for questions. Per mouse. So what we're expecting uh, that to be translated to would probably be around about 10 to the 12, 
uh, in the human nose. Yes, we did. So we've tried um, AV1 and AV6. So in terms of AV9, the beauty of AV9 was that we could re-administer. So for AV1 and 6, what we found was that even though the expression of the antibody was pretty much the same, um, there was a systemic uh, production of antibody that prevented successful re-administration. No, yes. fine. Uh, great work, Maria. I was wondering in the, in, if you thought about it, in the studies where you were, I think it was either the older animals or the lower doses or maybe some combinations where it seemed like you had partial protection mm -hmm. and then the replication of the flu outdid it. Do you think there's a factor of the flu actually causing uh, loss of the ciliated cells? And would, for some populations, it be, make sense to have both the combination of sort of the ciliated cells as the barrier for secreted antibody and, and systemic uh, or something like that? Yes, that, that's a very good question and something that we looked at as well at time of uh, necropsy or when we were peeling mice to actually look at the integrity of the epithelium or if there was any signs of damage and regeneration. Um, we didn't see that. So we're not quite sure what is occurring, and it could be that it's model-specific. That's a good question. Yes, Deb. Hi, Maria. In, uh, in your published uh, ferret studies, where you um, uh, saw protection against flu, did you measure the antibody levels in nasal washes of those ferrets? We did. And in that particular instance, um, the limitation of that approach, and I'm glad that you brought that up, is that it's very, very difficult to actually do nasal lavages um, in an amount of antibody that's so concentrated in the airway surface liquid layer, because again, as many in the room know, the volume is so small. So um, it was a yes, no answer. Yes, the antibody was there, but in terms of how much was there, it was in the nanograms, but how relevant that nanogram is, it's very hard to say, because again, you're over diluting something that could be, for example, as you know, the airway surface liquid layer the volume in the nose of a mouse is one microliter. So when we use 500 microliters to uh, so even harvest though you, it. So even though you only can have very low levels, you can still see flu protection because you're... Exactly. But again, what that, the correlation is something that we're still looking into. Hi. Um, you made it sound like the sterilizing immunization was less uh, effective than, uh, than allowing the infection to occur and having the animals develop you know, more robust immune response. So I'm wondering, that experiment that you did with the, with the mice where, you know, you were comparing the high and low dose, mm -hmm. if you challenged them again, same virus or same influenza six months after the immunization, did one group fare better than the other? So we tried it in both strains. We tried it in those animals that were immune competent, that we had that long-term sustained expression. And we tried it in those animals that were the immune compromised, so the RAG knockout, to see whether or not um, we could see protection. So for the immune competent, when we came back with an irrelevant uh, strain, so for one that they shouldn't have mounted an immune response, and these were done with the FI6, not this multi-domain antibody, we saw protection as predicted, because this antibody would work. For the RAGs, we did see, again, a significant amount of body weight loss. So high so or low dose is better or worse on rechallenge with the same virus? Uh, in terms of when you have a dose that is very high to start with, it's sufficient to protect. If you have a lower dose, if you provide like a 10 to the 9 dose, that's uh, partially protective against a subsequent infection. Yes. Okay. Thank you.